Welcome to World Med School. My name is Dr. Robert Newman, and I'm director of the Global Malaria Program at the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. In this micro lecture, I'm going to talk to you about malaria today and tomorrow, and what are some of the progresses and challenges that we face. A lot of what I'm going to present today comes from the World Malaria Report, which WHO produ produces on behalf of member states with the support of many partners annually. The last decade of malaria control has been possible because of a huge increase in international funding that's been made available. And as you can see on this slide, we've gone from about $200 million a year up to new, nearly $2 billion a year in international resources for malaria control. And this has made possible the scale-up of life-saving interventions. Those core interventions are indoor residual spraying with insecticides, long-lasting insecticide-treated nets, rapid diagnostic tests, and effective antimalarial medicines, especially what are known as artemisinin-based combination therapies, or ACTs. In this next slide, we can see the increase in household ownership with long-lasting insecticide-treated nets. And the lighter line, which rises up to about 53%, is a huge increase over just a few percentage, uh, a few percentage points of households that had long-lasting insecticide-treated nets at the beginning of the decade. The darker line shows the proportion of people who are sleeping under an insecticide-treated net the night before. And again, this is all in sub-Saharan Africa. And so while these increases are very dramatic, they're a long way from universal coverage, which is our goal, in fact, of having absolutely everyone protected by vector control, either indoor residual spraying or an insecticide-treated net. In this slide, you can see that there has been a huge increase in the number of deliveries of these insecticide-treated nets to sub-Saharan Africa over the past decade, peaking in 2010 at more than 150 million nets that were actually delivered. We've seen a sharp drop-off in that in 2011 and 2012. This is of great concern because the long-lasting insecticide-treated nets generally last an average of three years. And so unless there's major increases in deliveries this year, there's a risk that many people will go unprotected. In this slide, we can see the increase in indoor residual spraying that's happened over the past decade, especially on the African continent. And that's the lightest of these lines that rises up um, above 10% and then reaches a plateau. As you saw with the long-lasting insecticide-treated nets, there was great progress, and then there's been some slowing of that progress over the last couple of years as flat funding has actually plateaued, and that remains of grave concern to all of us working to support countries in their fight against malaria. This slide shows these results for Africa on a map, and basically darker is a higher percentage of coverage with either long-lasting insecticide-treated nets or indoor residual spraying. So the countries that are darkest have achieved more than 80% uh, coverage of at-risk populations, and the lightest are less than 25%. And so while this map is very different than it was 10 years ago, it really still isn't at the point we need it to be, which is all of those countries need to have coverage above 80% of their at-risk populations. In this slide, we can see what's happened with diagnostic testing for malaria. The line that I'd like you to focus on is the line that starts at the lowest point, down near 0% in 2000, and rises up to over 40% by 2011. And this line is actually what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa. And we can see now that more than 40% of people who are appearing with suspected malaria in a public health facility in Africa now receive a diagnostic test. And again, while that's a vast improvement over what it was like 10 years ago, it's still a long way from having universal access to diagnostic testing. So what is the public health impact of all of these efforts? On this complicated graph, you can see a series of pie charts divided by WHO geographic region showing progress in achieving a 75% reduction in malaria case incidence by 2015. And 50 countries are actually on track to meet this target. And while that sounds impressive, the problem is that these are often the smallest countries and together account for only 3% of cases uh, estimated globally. I do want you to note the left-hand pie chart. That's Africa. 
And what you can see in that is that the vast majority of countries actually there have insufficient data to actually say how we're doing on progress, a point that I'll come back to in just a few minutes. In this next slide, when I press play, you'll be able to see on a map the entire world on what's happened in global changes in the malaria death rate over the past 10 years. And I think it's most interesting to actually, again, focus on what's happened in Africa. And in this map, dark, uh, is, uh, dark red is actually the highest uh, malaria death rate and green is lowest. And if you focus on Africa, you can see the progress that's happened over the last 10 years. And so what does this translate to in terms of summary numbers? Well, malaria mortality rates have declined by an estimated 25% globally and by 33% in the WHO African region. And these are really very impressive gains. But again, if you think that our overall goal is a 75% reduction, there's still a lot of work to be done. This translates into more than a million lives having been saved over the past decade, most of those lives in Africa. So looking ahead, what are some of the challenges that still face us in this long fight? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, we still have a lot of cases and deaths from malaria. As you can see on this slide, we have an estimated 219 million cases and 660,000 deaths worldwide from malaria with a fair degree of uncertainty around those estimates because the data actually aren't good enough. And where are those deaths? In this graph, you can focus on the leftmost bar again is Africa, and you can see that the vast majority of those 660,000 deaths, nearly 600,000 of them, are on the African continent, nearly all of those in children under the age of five years of age. In this next slide, we can actually see this in a bit more detail. This sale diagram shows malaria cases on the left-hand side and malaria deaths on the right-hand side by country. I'll just have you focus on the right-hand side of this graph, which is deaths, and you can see that 14 countries make up 80% of the world's malaria mortality, almost all of those in Africa. And in fact, two of them alone, Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, because of their large populations and the fact that they have intrinsically high malaria risk, still make up more than 40% of the world's deaths from malaria. This next map, which is from the Malaria Atlas Project, shows why this is the case. You can see here the dark purple is increased intrinsic potential for disease spread. This is known as the basic reproductive number, or R0. And because of the efficiency of the malaria anopheline vector in Africa, you see that the greatest intrinsic potential for disease spread is in fact there. And that lines up, of course, with the maps that you've seen earlier that show that that's where, in fact, the greatest burden remains. One of the other challenges that face us is that while we've been talking about malaria deaths, which is the small green triangle at the top of this pyramid, and life-threatening illnesses, which is the red part under it, and febrile illnesses, which need to be diagnosed as the orange part, that, as we've noted, we have insufficient data, and only part of those are known to health services. But even more startling is the fact that underneath that is a large burden of asymptomatic malaria, which we actually currently don't know how to estimate. And this presents a large challenge when we talk about some of the ambitious goals that the world has set for itself in terms of reducing malaria burden. Another major challenge is the rise of resistance to artemisinins, which are the core component of artemisinin-based combination therapies, or ACTs. And this resistance to these medicines has emerged in what's known as the Greater Mekong subregion. And so far, we have identified resistance in Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam, largely along the borders between these countries, where many people have a difficult time accessing health, health services. Containment efforts have been going on in this area since 2008. And just this past World Malaria Day, WHO, together with the affected countries, released an emergency response framework known as the Emergency Response to Artemisinin Resistance. Um, and this plan aims to galvanize the world's resources to stop this problem before it can spread outside of the greater Mekong subregion. There are data to suggest that when the resistance to chloroquine, a previous generation of antimalarial medicines, 
arose in Africa, it was responsible for huge increases in child mortality on the African continent. And we really can't allow the gains of the past decade to slip away from us if resistance to the medicines we have today were to reach Africa. So we are putting a lot of effort into making sure that that does not happen. We also have increasing resistance to the insecticides that we use for indoor residual spraying and the insecticides that are used on the long-lasting insecticide-treated gnats. Those insecticides are known as pyrethroids, and we're very, very dependent on this safe and efficacious class of insecticides. In response to this threat, WHO released in 2012 the Global Plan for Insecticide Resistance Management, which aims to supply countries with a toolkit of plans to avoid this problem from spreading further. There are great opportunities ahead of us. One of them is to think about malaria not just as a fight against this one disease, but to put it in the context of being a major killer of children. And if you bundle it together with the other two big killers of children outside of the neonatal period, which are pneumonia and diarrhea, we have a tremendous opportunity to make a difference in improving child survival. You can see on this pie chart on the right-hand side of this slide that again, malaria, pneumonia, and diarrheal disease make up the vast majority of childhood deaths outside of the neonatal period. And so bundling together diagnostic testing and treatment for malaria together with diagnosis and treatment for pneumonia and diarrheal disease at the community level where many people currently don't have access to good care represents a tremendous opportunity. Another opportunity is improving diagnostic testing. Since 2010, WHO has recommended that all suspected cases of malaria receive a diagnostic test. And here on this graph, you can see the startling results of that. This is a bit complicated, but I want to walk you through it. The purple line that starts up near 60%, and this is, by the way, a graph of what's happening in Senegal, shows that the vast majority of cases with fever received an antimalarial, in this case an artemisinin-based combination therapy, at the beginning of 2007. In the middle of 2007, Senegal introduced rapid diagnostic tests nationwide, and the green line that rises sharply to the right shows the proportion of cases, suspected cases at health facilities that were receiving a rapid diagnostic test, and that rises to more than 90% over about 18 months. The blue line shows the proportion of those rapid diagnostic tests that were positive. And I want to call your attention to what happens in mid-2008, where the purple and blue lines meet. And here what you see is now the proportion of people actually receiving an antimalarial parallels the proportion of people who are positive, which is exactly what we want to see happen. There's no point to giving an antimalarial medicine to someone that has another cause for their fever, say pneumonia or urinary tract infection, as this does them no good at all and wastes valuable resources. Finally, one of the things that we have as an opportunity with diagnostic testing is to improve surveillance. For many years, especially in Africa, where fever has been equated with malaria, what we've counted are actually fever cases rather than confirmed malaria cases, making it very difficult to track progress since many, many different things can cause fever. Last year in 2012, the WHO Director General, Dr. Margaret Chan, went to Namibia where she released updated surveillance guidelines for malaria, which are pictured here, as well as a new global campaign called T3, or Test, Treat, Track, which has a very simple concept behind it, that every suspected case of malaria should receive a diagnostic test. All confirmed cases of malaria should receive a quality assured antimalarial medicine, and that the disease should be tracked through timely and accurate surveillance. And this campaign is now taking root across the world and is really increasing our, window, our visibility into what is happening with malaria. Why is this so important today? Because reducing malaria is like draining a pond. On the left-hand side of this graph, you can see what it looked like looking down into that pond 10 years ago. If the blue water is malaria, there was malaria everywhere where there was malaria risk. 10 years into this fight, the pond is starting to be drained, and there are high spots where there's no malaria, and there are spots where there's still a lot of ongoing malaria transmission. And being able to see the bottom, which we can only do through surveillance, allows us to figure out where do we need to keep doing more of what we've been doing, where do we need to change course, and where do we potentially just need more resources to do more of what we have been doing.
This uh, slide shows a very nice example from the Lao PDR where they've used what's known as microstratification. They've used surveillance data to divide up the country and show where is malaria burden high and low. And that's allowed them to actually target different packages of interventions towards malaria to different parts of the country which have different levels of malaria transmission. And here's a real life example of how that's playing out now in Africa. Last year, WHO recommended a new strategy for the Sahel subregion of Africa known as seasonal malaria chemo prevention. This involves giving monthly doses of amodiaquin together with sulfadoxine pyrimethamine to children under the age of five in areas with very seasonal malaria transmission, where most of the malaria is in four months of the year or less. What's astonishing is that combining these two old-fashioned medicines through this simple strategy prevents 75% of all malaria episodes and more than 75% of severe malaria episodes. But putting this into practice requires data because unless you know where the malaria is concentrated in less than four months of the year and where it's not, then it's very difficult to figure out where to apply this very promising strategy. I want to conclude with a few thoughts to take a sort of step back and look at the larger picture. The greatest threat to malaria control today is actually financial. We know what to do. We know the interventions that save lives. None of them are perfect, but together they can save every life uh, that's affected by malaria. But to do that, we need more resources than we have today. And that really is a major threat to continued forward progress. Because ultimately, fighting malaria is like compressing a spring. And you can only compress that spring so long as there are actually resources to allow you to deliver the interventions that allow that compression, namely vector control, diagnostic testing, treatment, and surveillance. And if you let go of that spring, we know what will happen, as you can see on this slide, which is that we'll snap back to right where we began. And that would really be a senseless tragedy. This graph, which is a little busy, is a very nice, from a very nice paper by Justin Cohen and colleagues last year, shows what happens in a number of different countries when, in fact, control measures were relaxed, generally as a result of decreased funding for malaria programming. And here you can see that in every case, very quickly, the gains that had been made against malaria were lost. To win this fight going forward, we have to think outside of health. And for those of us who are physicians, sometimes this is a, very, is a big challenge because what we're trained in is health. But ultimately, the fight against malaria has to be thought of in the context of a multi-sectoral approach. We have to engage people involved in water and sanitation projects. The military, which sometimes uh, can actually transport malaria across borders, but can also be used to deliver malaria control interventions. We have to think about the housing stock that people live in, infrastructure projects that change the environment and move populations around, um, other environmental factors such as deforestation, which may be at play, as well as how do we tap into the education system and work to create a generation that believes they absolutely have the right to these life-saving commodities and really are going to fight malaria in their own countries. Ultimately, malaria and poverty are inextricably linked. As you can see on this graph, on the y-axis going up are malaria deaths per billion at risk in 2010, and on the x-axis is the proportion of the population living on less than one US dollar per day. And you can see that there's a clustering in the upper part of this graph. Those who are poorest suffer from malaria, and those who suffer from malaria wind up being poor. This is both a chicken and an egg problem here and they're inextricably intertwined. And so we need to both fight malaria to improve human development, and we need to improve all sorts of development activities in order to combat malaria. Ultimately, we need good health systems and human capacity because health commodities such as bed nets and diagnostic tests and antimalarial drugs don't deliver themselves. And the fight against malaria can only be won by well-trained people. Driving malaria burden downward requires a cycle of innovation. We need basic and applied research to develop antimalarial tools. Those need to be translated into policies at the global national level. Those need to be implemented in public health programs. And then we need surveillance, monitoring, and evaluation to measure how we're doing, which will help to inform what are the next research questions that we need to tackle if we want to keep this downward cycle going. Ultimately, we need to avoid unhelpful dichotomies in the fight against malaria. We hear people talking about Africa versus outside of Africa, 
control of malaria versus eventual elimination. Plasmodium falciparum, the most deadly species, versus Plasmodium vivax, which is widespread throughout the world and causes great uh, economic uh, damage. Attacking the vector, the mosquito, versus attacking the parasite. And saving lives today with the tools we have versus achieving eradication in the future. And ultimately, we need all of these things. It is not an either-or situation. Because today, no one should die for lack of a $5 bed net, a 50-cent diagnostic test, or a $1 uh, anti-malarial treatment. It's just morally unacceptable. And so I implore the next generation of physicians to work with us to make malaria a thing of the past. Thank you very much for studying with World Med School.